The Falcons Audible presented by AT&T is back. We're going to recap week two in the National Football League. We've got action on the field. We'll talk about the Falcons and some other things around the NFL. I'm going to be your host for the next, call it 20 to 30 minutes. I'm Derek Rackley. I'm along with my guys, Dave Archer and DJ Shockley. And hopefully if you've been tuning in to our podcast, by now you know these guys. So we can go ahead and just surpass the introductions because these guys are chomping at the bit to get into some discussion about the Falcons and of course the entire NFL. So before we get into that, let me give you a quick rundown of what we're gonna cover uh, in this episode of the Falcons Audible. Of course, quick reactions to the game last weekend. What did it all mean? We're gonna try to make sense of this game between Atlanta and Tampa Bay. We'll take a step away, talk about one of the teams in the division in the Jameis Winston and the New Orleans Saints kind of still seems odd saying not without saying uh, Drew Brees and Saints. Um, and then we'll recount, and we got two quarterbacks on the show. We get a chance for them to recount the best and maybe worst throws that they've ever made in competition. And then we'll look <laughs> ahead for the next couple of opponents for the Atlanta Falcons. So that's kind of the rundown of the show. But DJ, I'm going to start with you. We're going to go with quick reactions here, okay? All right. I want you to tell us the Number one, if you're encouraged or discouraged by what you saw in the Atlanta-Tampa game, and I want you to follow that up with your support. But here's the caveat, okay? Uh, okay. you got to give me one or two sentences, and that's it, okay? So you got to keep it short and sweet. What do they say, the five Bs? Be brief, my brother, be brief. All right, you're up. <laughs> what you made if, that up. What if, what, what if I got like run-on sentences? Run-on sentences don't work, dude, I guess not. All right. I am encouraged. Uh, obviously, in that ball game, you're down 28-10. You find a way to claw and fight back, and you're within three, and things don't go your way. Some uncanny things happen, but I'm encouraged by what happened. This team fought back, and I was excited about that. How was that? All right, Dave. About three sir, what you got? Yeah, I guess I'll go counterpoint. I'm discouraged, but I think I, – because I thought this team got off to a slow start and then fought their way back ultimately to let it bleed away on some screwy plays. So I'm kind of encouraged, but I'm discouraged too. <laughs> Sorry, Rack. I just – I think there's a lot of good things on both sides. Stop nailing me down, uh, man. Rack, Rack, be the be the equalizer and tell us are you encouraged okay, so or discouraged. somebody's got to break – in yeah. this thing, right? Yeah. Uh, okay, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna lean towards Art here, Arch here, and I'm gonna say that I'm discouraged because I expect in the NFL teams to be competitive with the amount of talent. Meaning, even though that the Atlanta Falcons are in a new regime, I still expect them to be competitive, even if it is the defending world champs. But I'm discouraged how the way the second half and specifically the fourth quarter ended up going. One of the biggest things that we always learn and are preached about is finishing in the NFL, and as we all know, the Atlanta Falcons did not finish in their game against Tampa. And by the way, if you want to get more podcast action and more breakdowns of the game, feel free to join our Atlanta Falcons insider, Scott Baer, Tori McElhaney, and Chris Rim on the Falcons final whistle as they get right into it after the games. You can find that information on all these same outlets to get some more podcast action of the breakdown. All right, so let's let's break it down a little bit more. And Arch, I'm going to come back to you. What does this mean? Because you guys kind of summarized it as far as Falcons in pretty good shape. It was a really good game after three quarters. And then for some reason, the wheels just fell off and things snowballed really fast. So what does this all mean? Kind of break down this game and what it means to you, Arch. Well, it means you're inconsistent. And I think that that probably is what you saw in week one. This one was a better version of that, but it's still inconsistency, right? You still lost the football game. You get off to a bit of a slow start defensively, and then you make a play defensively. So it, you get a kind of back and forth type scenario. You get down 28 to 10, you claw your way back in the game, and then it gets away from you again. I think that that is probably the word that sticks out to me is inconsistent. There's not a, a solid play, work of play on the offensive line. They're solid for a little bit, and then there's inconsistency. All of a sudden, we leak on on protections. We leak on some of the types of some of the stunts that come and force Matt Ryan to get the ball out too early. Uh, you can't throw the ball downfield because can't quite hold it long enough. Yet we wore them out with that short passing attack underneath. So the inconsistency. I guess is probably going back to your original question, Rack, is what kind of brings on this discouragement, if you will, is where is that consistency? Does it have, will it develop? I think it can, and certainly it has to develop pretty quickly if you want to contain, maintain some kind of competitive balance here inside the division. 
And DJ, what stuck out to you? Because, you know, we watch these games. Obviously, Dave's calling it, so he's right there for every single snap. You're watching this game as you got a vested interest in the team and, and covering them. But what sticks out to you? Because, yeah, there are things to be encouraged. But at the end of the day, DJ, you and Dave know that, like, we're not in the business to be encouraged, right? The NFL is a business of winning. So how did you make this game, at least how it shook out in the end? I think ultimately you look at – you're doing things in this ball game that shouldn't have gone the way it did. I mean, let's be point blank. You can't have a quarterback throw for five touchdowns in a ball game against you. Now you, you only give up 82 rushing yards. You were, you know, you held them to four of 12 on third down. But when they score five touchdowns in a ball game and the quarterback does that, that obviously means there are some other areas they're doing really good on. Maybe it's first and second down. They're not even getting a third down at times. Maybe uh, there are things in the ball game you look back and say we had our opportunities. Uh, but I also am encouraged about how well you did in the red zone. There were times where you needed to score touchdowns in this game. As much as they were scoring touchdowns, you needed to have that a part of your arsenal in this ball game and be able to do it. I thought Cordell Patterson showed a lot of versatility in this ball game. I think he is starting to become one of those guys that you know you can depend on. Arch just talked about there are some of the things that are very inconsistent without this team. Well, there are some guys who are starting to be consistent, and you know coming to a ball game you can depend on it. You heard Arthur Smith talk about, I know I have some guys I can depend on now. And I think even though we're discouraged about the outcome, we're discouraged about being 0-2, I think Arthur Smith knows now exactly who is in that locker room with him. And a lot of times when you go into a new season with a, a new staff and a new regiment, everybody's trying to learn each other. Well, I think now he's starting to understand the guys that he can depend on in certain spots and guys that can do certain things. And I think Cordell Patterson is one of those guys you, you see you're starting to depend on. We saw Kyle Pitts emerge in this ballgame. You even heard him talk about, I understand the coverage is a little bit better in this ballgame. Things slow down a little bit more for him. So there's things that obviously we all want to see improve. We want them to be more consistent. But there's also things that you can see where this team is starting to grow in this ballgame. How about Matt Ryan on zone read, Arch? I mean – Jumping in the end zone? I mean, I know Arch was yelling at at that point when he, you know, went airborne to get into the zone. I mean, this is a guy who's been around for 14 seasons, and he's giving his body up. And those are things that you can absolutely build on. And like I said, we, we, like you mentioned, there's still a lot to improve on. We don't want to be in the encouraging business, but there's still a lot of things that we can be excited about. Yeah, and I agree with you guys. And and one of my college coaches, Glenn Mason, used to always tell us, that the point in the game, there will be four to five plays that will make a difference in swaying it either direction. And as I'm watching every game, whether I'm scouting a game that I'm going to be calling or I'm watching Atlanta kind of see like how is this game going to unfold, you see the stop in the third quarter defensively, the punt they get the ball back. First down play, what is it? They pick up eight yards to leave a second and two, and then it's come up short on second down, stuffed on third down, bad punt, And then everything just went downhill from that point on, right? And that was the point where it was like, there's your three to four plays in the game that are potentially going to make a difference. And sure enough, it ended up doing that. I mean, Dave, did you kind of see that as you're calling this? You're like, oh, goodness, here we go. Like, this was the opportunity. All we got to do is pick up a first down, and maybe it changes the complexion of the fourth quarter. I thought there were a couple of plays like that, Rack, and I'll even take it back further, the opening drive of the second half. You go down and get a field goal. Remember, kind of an excuse me field goal right at the end of the first half mm-hmm. to draw the score to 21-10, and you're going to start the second half with the football. Mm-hmm. Now, you get backed up. You get a bad penalty. Remember, Avery Williams catches that short kick and drives return. and returns it yeah. all the way out over the 50-yard line. Yeah. You're going to start in plus territory you get an illegal block backs you back up to your 10 yard line okay we still have the football let's get started Ryan on a short pass he's got Russell Gage wide open for a little zone beater for about a five or six yard gain balls tipped in the air by Vita Vea Shaq Barrett picks it off two plays later they throw a touchdown pass well or three plays later they throw a touchdown pass but if you go to the second play of that drive for Tampa Tom Brady tries to throw a back shoulder fade. Fabian Moreau drops an interception. Oh, yeah. They've got an interception to flip the script. Two yard on you. There's just two sequences right there that are that started the second half that would have changed the potentially the complexion of the game. Have to make the plays when you have an opportunity. We saw a ball batted in the air. Shaq Barrett caught it, set him up in field position. We had an up. opportunity for Fabian Moreau to intercept it and flip the script. We didn't make the play. They scored a touchdown on a Mike Evans touchdown pass. 
Yeah, I mean, there's obviously, as you go back to a game like that, you think about the missed opportunities. When you scratched and clawed to get so close to to really getting over the hump and maybe going down to Tampa and stealing away for, uh, a game from the defending world champs, and then you miss the couple plays that you're talking about, Arch, it's going to be extremely difficult to beat that team. All right, guys, let's take a step back from this one because there's some other action and there's some fun things that I want to get to. But... There was a game as far as the Saints playing the Panthers, right? Obviously, we're in this new generation, if you will, of a quarterback for the New Orleans Saints not named Drew Brees. Jameis Winston gets off to a great start a week ago, and some would say he kind of came back to Jameis Winston this past week, throwing a couple of bad interceptions. And I just want to ask this question, DJ, I'm going to start with you. You saw week one, you got a chance to see week two. Do you think the Saints are a contender in this division with Jameis being the starting quarterback, or do you think they don't have any lasting power? I'm going to be honest, I don't. Um, and I say that because of what happened, you just mentioned what happened in week one, and then what happens in week two. This is the same Jameis Winston that we saw in Tampa. Would we'll go out and throw 30 touchdowns, but also throw 30-plus interceptions. And in this league, you have to be consistent. I mean, Arch just talked about it with the Falcons. Consistency is key. And when you have quarterbacks in this league that can go out week in and week out and not turn the football over and can be the reason why you win games, those are the teams that are going to win ball games. Those are the teams that are going to win divisions. They're going to win. They're going to be vying for it every single year. And that's the reason why Drew Brees is so beloved in that city and beloved as a quarterback because he didn't lose a game for you. He did everything to help you. Yeah, he had games where he throw an interception or two, but he was consistent in his play. And over the years – that's been the mantra of Jameis Winston is he has not been consistent with his play week in and week out. So when you come into a ball game, you're not sure which Jameis you're going to get. You're going to get the guy who's going to thread a needle and he's going to go out and throw for 300 and look like, okay, the Saints are the real deal in week one. And you come out in week two and you say, I don't know who that guy is. This is the same guy we're used to seeing. So until he becomes the consistent player and does it week in and week out, I don't trust Jameis Winston and I don't trust him to lead this Saints team to where ultimately they want to be. But consistency is all for me, and I ain't seen it out of Jameis. Arch, what about you? Over the course of a now 17-game regular season, with what you've seen from Jameis Winston, buying or selling them in the NFC South? I'm buying. I'm buying Sean Payton. I'm buying the talent around Jameis Winston. I'm buying their defense. They're legit on the defensive side of the football. And I think there's enough playmakers around Jameis that he can make some plays. I would say that uh, – with Alvin Kamara back on the field, those kind of guys can make plays for him. Jameis Winston also has Sean Payton to kind of rein him in. Was it a bad throw? There's no question about it. But I can go back to look at numbers. Jameis Winston is a Tampa Bay Buck quarterback against the Atlanta Falcons. He was 3-1 to one touchdowns to interception ratio. He has the ability to do it. And there's been some other guys. Now, I don't want to compare him to a Brett Favre, who's a Hall of Famer. There's guys that try to shove it into coverage. Now, he he makes some dumb throws, and this certainly was a <laughs> dumb one this weekend. There's yeah. no question about it. It cost his football teams uh, team. But I do think that he has the ability, and there's enough ability around them on that team. There's a winning culture there. I would not bet against the Saints with Jameis Winston playing quarterback. It's interesting that you bring up Sean Payton, and I would uh, – I mean, granted, look, Jameis is not a rookie, right? He's been around the league. But it seems like if Sean Payton can somehow, some way, get through his head that we don't need the disaster throw, right? Like – you never want to compare two quarterbacks, especially a guy in Drew Brees that's going to be a first ballot Hall of Famer. But I couldn't help but think when Jameis made that bad throw, getting pressure, falling over into double, if not triple coverage, that Drew Brees is not going to make that mistake, right? He's not going to throw that ball in the middle of the field and let somebody else catch it. So if Sean Payton can somehow, some way, get him away from throwing that catastrophic interception, maybe they're competitive. But right now, I'm selling it with DJ. I just don't know if I see it so far. Go ahead, Shock. I want to add this. Did you just I raise your hand? I, I, you raise I absolutely hand? raised my hand because I did what not is? want to interrupt Rack in his soliloquy right there. I did not want to interrupt him. Who does that? But here's the, here's the, here's the thing I want, to, I want to pose to you, Arch. You say he's got Sean Payton. Mm -hmm. This is not Jameis' first year with the Saints. But it's his first year as the starter. It don't matter. He in his system, though. He's been in it for a year. That's fine to be sitting behind a desk as I raise my hand to ask a question. <laughs> That's fine to be sitting behind a desk and listen to Drew Brees well, answer all a, the he's questions. Not, he's not a rookie Now either. you're on the field. But he not he a wasn't rookie. on the field. He played last year. 
Yeah, what in mop up duty? Here, here, come in. We're ahead. Come on, man. You can't compare that. <laughs> I'm just saying he been in the I, system. I, I get he's been what you're saying. Peyton. Sure, like he should not be making these same decisions and bad decisions when he has that guy around him. And I guarantee you, Sean Payton, didn't, he didn't go a whole year and tell Jameis, "Hey, look, wait till next year. We'll coach you and we'll make sure you no, don't make these decisions." No, but I, I do think though. Saying it to a guy and having him go through it physically are two different things. Right. So the right. only way you get that out of you is to go play through it. Right. He didn't get a chance to do that. Sure, he had a guy saying, hey, don't make that throw. See this throw on tape? Don't make that throw. We can't have that. Right. But he physically has to go through that thought process. You and I were talking before we came on. Quarterback decision-making is in a split second. Yeah. And so that's not something that just immediately goes out. It takes you a little while. You have to make some of those mistakes before you can get through it in that system. So I, I, I get it. I know what you're saying. He's made those mistakes before. Yeah. This is the first time he's making those mistakes with Sean Payton sitting there who's going to evaluate him after the game. All right. I got you. All right, Arch. So you talk about making mistakes and learning from, from them. Let's have a little fun here. <laughs> you guys are both quarterbacks. Arch, let's yeah. start with you. Tell us about the worst throw that you've ever made. Maybe one that you made a bad throw and you learned <laughs> from the mistake because it was so bad. Well, uh, this is one that all quarterbacks and shocks made this throw too. So don't <laughs> let him kid you. He made this throw as well. We're playing the San Francisco 49ers right here in Atlanta in old Fulton County Stadium. And here's young Dave Archer. And he's, oh, I can run around. I can make plays. I got the arm to make that throw. I'm on the dead run to the right. Um, I'm headed towards the 49ers sideline, and I, I'm i thinking, don't make that throw back over the middle, but it's like your body doesn't listen to your brain. And I go, ah, they throw it on the dead run. Uh, and what's the one throw a quarterback can't make? Back in the middle late the over the middle. Yeah. I was as late as can be. The bus had already left. I was off. The, <laughs> they had left, and I'm throwing it over the middle, picked uh, off. In the red zone, not not in the middle of the field, not in my end. Uh, I took points off the board, much like Jameis did this weekend. Horrible decision, horrible oh, throw. Man. I'd like to say I learned from it, Rack, but I'm not sure I did. I think I made the throw again a number couple of times in my career. But that was the worst one. It sticks in my mind. Here we got a chance to beat Joe Montana and the 49ers, and I throw a yank over the middle of the field with a, with a chance to put points on the board. <laughs> That's tough. Big shock. Listen, That's I've tough. known you for probably about 15 years, oh, okay? Man. And I've, I've always seen you as a pretty confident guy, yeah. meaning confident with yourself, maybe with your athletic ability. And we know you can run, right? You use those legs. So tell us about one of the worst decisions you've ever made throwing the football. All right, so we're going to go back to college here, and we're going to go to on the road my senior year. So this okay. means I've been around for a minute. I played in a bunch of a bunch of games, and I understand certain throws you just can't make. We were, me and Arthur were just talking about. He was talking about Jeff George making this unbelievable throw from one hash to the other. So we're playing against Tennessee on the road. I'd have completed probably four of these out routes from one hash to the other hash. I snap the foot. We go play action to the left. We're on the right hash. We play action to the left. We're throwing an out route. I done completed this same out route on the same corner at least three times in a game. I hit my back foot, and as soon as I let it go, I instantly, when I say instantly, I instantly took an angle to go make the tackle. <laughs> because before I even let it go, I knew it was picked off. And guess what? It was picked off. I ended up hitting the guy like the two-yard line, so saving the pick six. But it was my dumb self that said, okay, I, I done completed this pass four times in this game on this same dude. He been off, and he was off on this particular play. But as soon as I hit my back foot and I go to let it go, he is planted. I mean, he ain't moved. And he drives on it, and I instantly take the angle because I got to go make a tackle. So terrible throw, terrible <laughs> decision. And uh, I was just glad I was able to make the play. Look, DJ, that defensive back over there said – this quarterback is not completing that same pass <laughs> on me again. Even if they want an out and up, I'm going to pick it off. And I guess sometimes defensive players have to guess right. Well, it sounds like he ended up guessing right on that one. I like that, fellas. Sometimes you got to get a little vulnerable, right? Like, yeah. hey, yeah. yeah, I was played in the NFL. I was, you know, big time SEC quarterback, but. Guess what? I right. made mistakes hey, right, as right. well. Have you ever uh, two, three bounce went back there to the to the punter? I mean. You have to have uh, one. What was your ever? worst snap in a game, Rack? 
in a game, no, not two, three. But when I was in college, <laughs> I did snap one over a guy's head when I was in college. And oh. you know what? Talk about learning from a mistake. It was This was my red shirt freshman year. It was the first year that I started long snapping at Minnesota. I'll never forget. I was at Purdue, right? And I got excited. Like there was, there was a rush coming at me. So I had to snap it and get up right away to try to protect. And all of a sudden, I hear the roar of the crowd, right? <laughs> the and when the punt's going on, like, and the, you never heard the the football hit a foot, and then you hear a crowd roar. <laughs> it's like, uh oh, oh no! <laughs> and of course, I turned around and went over the guy's head. Um, well, Rack, at least at least, at least at least you didn't hit the game. up back like the 49 or oh, like the Ram oh, yeah. guy did this weekend. <laughs> Ram snapper snaps it right into the up back, and it goes <laughs> sideways and costs the Rams a touchdown. <laughs> oh man. Uh, just might have been a little bit off target. Yeah. Uh, all right, so good. I always like the story time stuff. That that's good. Let's get let's write it back in here before we close it out, guys. We got let's 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 look ahead now. We talked about the game. We had a little fun. Let's look ahead for the Atlanta Falcons, Giants, Washington, and the New York Jets next on the schedule for them. Let's just talk about. And Arch, I'm going to start with you. If you're the head coach, if you're a player on this team going into this stretch, which maybe you would say is more manageable. What's the emphasis? What's your goal in this stretch upcoming? Well, first of all, not think about three games. I'm thinking about one game. I'm thinking about the Giants, and I know that that sounds like uh, you know the old adage, but it is. They, you got to get better today, the next day, and all that kind of stuff. That's where this team is. They're not good enough to think about a stretch of games. The Giants are certainly a team you can go beat. You can also go lose to the Giants. This is a team that's got a quarterback that can run. They got Zone Reed. They got Saquon Barkley, who's back off an injury, is an outstanding player. They've got three guys on the perimeter that can go make plays they got two really good tight ends mm -hmm. in Ingram and and Kyle Rudolph who comes over from the Vikings and yeah they've got some guys on the other side of the ball that can rush you so I think that this uh, it I think the number one scenario is let's just get one let's go get a win let's win this quarter let's win this quarter and let's put four quarters together the inconsistency let's get that out and let's play four quarters of football where we win each quarter you know, and if we can win each quarter, hey, I think we're going to like what it looks like at the end if we win all four quarters. Yeah. And then we'll worry about the, the Washington team because I think they create two different problems. Washington, we're going to the NFC East here, uh, get the Giants first, and then we get Washington back here in Atlanta. Washington's a different team to me than than where New York is. And New York's scrambling too now. Mm -hmm. They're hearing it. That's the New York media up there. They've lost two straight. They lost a game where they made a stupid mistake at the end of the Washington game where they jumped Jump offside sides. on the field goal, yeah. gave them a chance to re-rack it. Re-rack, how about that? Ooh. And kick it through. That's <laughs> off the cuff right there. Look at it. <laughs> kick, That's off the and cuff. And kick it through. So they get the win, and so they they're, you're leaving. We should have won that game, and you lost. So they're hearing it up there. So they're hearing the same thing our guys are hearing down there. So I think it's just a matter about, about focusing on this moment and trying to win each quarter rack. Yeah, I mean, us players, that's what we're going to do. We're going to focus on one game. So, DJ, I'll throw it back to you. If we're going to talk about winning the next game, give me one scenario or situation that the Falcons have to do better or win for them to win the game against the Giants. For me, it's kind of obvious, and it happened in the first two ball games. I think you have to win special teams. Um, obviously, that's a big part of the game. And, I mean, uh, Arch talked about it where – you have a sequence in the game where some plays don't happen and you have a, a bad punt or you have a bad situation where you don't change field position, that's the quickest way for a team to gain momentum. That's the quickest way for a team to feel good about itself is, hey, we got great field position. Let's go get some points. Let's go put stress on another team. You expect your offense and defense to play up to the standard in which they're supposed to play. They're going to make plays. Things are going to happen. You get Obviously, you get 60, 70 plays in a ball game on offense or defense. Special teams, you may get four or five a game. And, Rack, you talked about it. There are always three or four plays in a game that sometimes determine an outcome. And let's just say you don't have the right field position. Or you can change field position with a punt or get somebody within the 10-yard line. Or you, you tackle them on kick return and you, you get inside the 15. Whatever it may be, make a team go full field. If you can win special teams, that gives you a chance to win the ball game. So I'm, I'm expecting this team to play a lot better uh, in the special teams part of the ball game because – we saw offense come on. We saw defense have some good moments in the last couple ball games. Now let's see the third phase come in as well and pick up that, that slack and, and also have a big part of the, helping the team win. 
Yeah, I, I agree with that, DJ. And I would just add on top of it, I would like to see, we talked a little bit about consistency or maybe more inconsistencies. I would like to see some more consistency on the offensive line. And I think we'll see a more consistent yeah. performance of the offense being able to move the chains and everything. If we can get things cleaned up a little bit in front of Matt when he's trying to sort things out defensively uh, down the field. So um, that's going to wrap it up, guys. I, I I enjoy having the fun. I think I might enjoy you guys talking about the bad parts of your career, <laughs> maybe more than your analysis. Oh, man. Um, so the guys that are helping us put the show together, let's make sure that we have more things where uh. DJ and Arch can talk about what they did poorly <laughs> in their careers. As it, turns, uh. as it turns out, that might be the predominant part of what I would be talking about, unfortunately. <laughs> what is it in baseball? You hit 300. <laughs> You fail seven out of ten times, but you're considered a great player. Okay, completions. What, Shaq? We got or, or Shaq? We got to complete six to, out of ten, so you fail four times. Pretty good, yeah. Right I back. don't know. Maybe mine might have been the other way around. I don't know. Yeah, I have plenty of average days. Guys that, have, that have no problem taking a little shoulder of their mistakes. Oh, I enjoy right. it. Okay, on behalf of DJ Shockley and Dave Archer, that is the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley joining you one more time. We'll be back next week to recap Atlanta's game against the New York Giants, and we will try to find some time to have a little bit of fun in there. Thanks so much for joining us, everybody. Once again, this is the Falcons Audible presented by at and Enjoy your week. <laughs>